everyone. This is our second event on GW Entrepreneurship Week. My name is Ayman Tarabishi. I'm Deputy Chair of the Department of Management at the George Washington University School of Business. And I'm also President and CEO of the ICSB, the International Council for Small Business. And this is our second event. And we are just delighted um, to have Dr. Nasrul back again. The title of this event is Digital Entrepreneurship. This is now the third of a series uh, on, we're talking about digital entrepreneurship here. So this is gonna be an amazing conversation that we talk about digital entrepreneurship and, and more in the specific, the theme here is, is starting and scaling digital platforms on the fringe, uh, renegotiating legitimacy and identity. What, what a powerful title. Um, Dr. Nasutara, <laughs> I think it's seriously powerful. And Dr. Sutara is a senior lecturer at Bournemouth University in the UK, and um, he's been with us now for since the summer, working on these series here. So we're just delighted. He has a couple of posts articles written with us, and so I don't want to take a lot from his time. But um, Dr. Nasu, the floor is yours. Thank you for being part of GW Entrepreneurship Week, <laughs> and, and let's kick it off. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, I'm, I'm very delighted to be here as always. And thank you so much, um, Ayman and, and the team uh, for a wonderful opportunity to be able to present to uh, on your platform. Uh, it's always been great. Um, every time I present here, a lot of people do come to me uh, multiple times and um, we, we do take this forward, you know, afterwards. So this has been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I, I feel absolutely excited today uh, in particular to present to you something that I consider to be um, at the intersectionality of my research and also um, professional practice as a digital entrepreneur. So this convergence, this intersectionality means a lot to me because I do practice as a digital entrepreneur on one hand, but also I actively research digital entrepreneurship and um, digital platforms, so to speak. So um, you welcome everyone. And um, you might be wondering, you know, like, you know, it's such a, a lengthy title, but also, you know, quite very interesting. I'd, as it has got a lot of uh, things going on, um, like fringe, uh, legitimacy, identity. I, I believe these are all things that uh, kind of uh, tend to have some kind of um, universal appeal that everyone wants to you know, know more about. So hence um, why the presentation today. So um, basically, I, I think what is happening is that the, there is some kind of, um, um, revolution, I would call it. Many people call it a revolution on digital platforms. Um, the digital platforms from around the world continue to rise and rise and rise. And some people, some experts expressed some kind of skepticism while some are saying, well, uh, we, we shouldn't, it's a kind of mixed, you know, some are saying we should be scared or some are saying, well, there's nothing to be scared about. We should just try and understand the explosion of platforms from across the world. Um, I think, you know, we are approaching that cusp uh, in history where possibly at a point in time, we would lose, um, you know, count of how many platforms uh, exist uh, on our planet. So it is past rapidly becoming um, a, a world of uh, platforms. So you would, have come across terms like platform economy, platform capitalism, platform innovation, uh, platformization. These are some of the variations of the terms um, that, that are being uh, used. So uh, I call this the kind of uh, inevitability um, phenomenon in which like whatever is it that you're doing now, we are reaching a point where um, due to the way our digital world um, is, is framed, that you would either find yourself um, contributing um, a, a user of your platform or contributing to a platform um, in terms of developing the digital artifacts, or maybe you're just um, using the platform uh, or creating content as a kind of user generated content. So, but somehow, inevitably you would find yourself being associated with a certain platform and, and this is real and therefore it deserves careful attention to understand you know, this phenomena and to see to what extent we would engage uh, with this. Um, but also um, 
you know, I would like to set the context clear for this presentation. So um, my research and professional practice currently, uh, because, you know, this is a dynamic process, it keeps changing, um, you know, it gives more emphasis to this idea of what happens with enterprises and especially uh, currently digital enterprises or digital platforms that operate in the peripheral regions or hostile environments, but also, um, uh, you know, those that are operating in what I call the, the negative place brands. Now, um, I th this happens to me not just by um, by by accident. I think it's just uh, I have been motivated to focus my attention and 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 practice as an entrepreneur to this for a reason, uh, um, and also to lay um, to, to to put this to, to perspective. Last year, in one of my uh, publications. Um, digital entrepreneurship in sub-Saharan Africa. We published a, a paper um, about renegotiating legitimacy, and this is mainly discussing how digital enterprises that find themselves operating in a place brand that is being perceived somewhat by, you know, uh, the rest of the world as having some kind of negative country of origin effect, and. As a result, you know, um, because of the attention that receives and the discussion that comes forward, then we decided to expand this research because what we notice is that it is not only just about um, the, the country of origin negative effects, but there are so many other platforms from around the world that experiences what I call the cumulative multiple disadvantage and hence why I use the term fringe. So these are all the digital platforms that may be in any part of the world, not only Africa, that may be experiencing uh, some kind of perception of uh, lack of legitimacy because of uh, lack of operating history, uh, because of um, difficulty in access to resources or lack of entrepreneurial opportunities uh, altogether. So I, I say this, you know, um, because from the, uh, I, I've got some story I wanna share with you why this is very important uh, for me. Uh, personally, uh, having uh, originally come from Nigeria, and I know that despite uh, it being a great country, but also it has got uh, this tendency to be perceived as a, um, with the tendency for country of origin, uh, effect. So I want to share a story with you, like sometimes when I first arrived in, in the United Kingdom, because that's where I live uh, currently. Um, so a friend of mine, when we, were st we studied together, um, you know, we become really good friends. And she told me that once she was discussing with her mother and she told her that, well, she's got this great friend is from Nigeria and they get along really well. And um, she was surprised when her mom told her, okay, right, that's nice, but uh, be a little careful, you know, but this my friend, because she trusted me, she then come back and she told me, uh, I said, okay, don't worry about it. Um, it's fine. She said, but why, haven't you seemed so very concerned? I said, it's not that I'm not concerned, but it's not the first time I've had this, but it's probably not gonna be uh, uh, the last. So I know for people, you know, um, you know, operating businesses in such countries, um, you know, this, you know, cause a lot of uh, damage because before you even launch, uh, you have been perceived as perhaps maybe not to have the tendency to be um, credible and, and, and legitimate uh, uh, of some sort. So um, th that's one thing. Another thing is that um, because I now live in Great Britain, I try to use the power of uh, platform economy to try and identify some viable platforms in, in Africa and try to merge them with some, um, you, you know, hopefully uh, good investors uh, in, in, in the rest of the world, United Kingdom, so any other parts of the world. So, but again, I again notice that whenever I, because, you know, there are some companies that I'm, um, you know, trying to, to help find investors, for example, a company called Usage, a very dedicated young um, 
um, you know, entrepreneurs in Nigeria who are trying to bring um, um, a, a lot of informal um, entrepreneurs to, to the marketplace using digital uh, digitalization so that they don't have to create a, a website. But because of the issues to do with, say, for example, the origin, um, sometimes it's very hard uh, you, you know, to traverse the, the, the negotiations so, so, so easily. So this together, you know, motivated me to try to find, you know, more about this. But also, like I said, this isn't just about those countries. It's, it's about the whole world where you having platforms that are operating on the fringe. And for me, I think there is a lot of um, useful information and also knowledge that we are missing um, if we don't understand what is happening in the peripheral, um, you know, kind of fringe, um, you know, um, side of our, our worlds. So this is the basis. So as I proceed in this presentation, I'm going to be sharing both personal experiences, but also uh, more importantly, I think would be the empirical evidences that I've collected over the years to try to make a point. Okay, so um, the starting point is that, like I said, you know, for those digital platforms, because the title is about starting and scaling digital platforms from the fringe, the free legitimacy challenge. So um, I look at the literature on legitimacy and generally the literature tend to be silent on free legitimacy capital. And by that, I mean, like, you know, for most of these digital enterprises that are potentially being started on the fringe, they tend to be perceived as guilty until proven innocent, which is um, quite, um, it's the opposite that's supposed to be the case that you are innocent until you've proven guilty. But because of the um, pre-legitimacy tendency to assume that, um, you know, these companies are more likely not to, to act um, in, in a very credible way, then that tend to affect them negatively. Now, what I said is that the, what I find is that the literature is, is silent on this. So one of the things I focused in is to find out, like, you know, when you think about this kind of um, environments, there are three things that tend to happen. So either you start a digital enterprise, and then you, you, you got stuck, or for others, you know, they kind of re retrogress, you know, they couldn't proceed and they given off on their dream. But there are always those few that always counteract this negative uh, tendencies of cumulative, um, you know, multiple disadvantages and, and tend to, to go forward. And for me, that is absolutely what I'm really interested in, trying to find out what do they do differently that others are not doing and what can we learn from them? Okay, very recently um, from Nigeria, we've had uh, the story in the last couple of weeks where um, a company called Paystack was acquired by, by Strife, um, worth, uh, the deal worth uh, $200 million. And this happened within the space of about five years. And um, according to the story, um, I, I think uh, the investment rounds initially they had was about uh, 11, they raised about $11.7 um, million. But then now at the exit point being acquired at 200 million by far, this has been um, talked about as one of the most successful, um, as one of the most successful um, deals, you know, of, of, of in, in the platform world um, in Africa, and perhaps uh, could be comparable to many uh, from around the world. Uh, they've had, I think, about 60,000 users in Nigeria and Ghana. They roll out to South Africa. And if they've been exited at $200 million, uh, imagine what value they would have if they scaled throughout the continent or perhaps maybe um, around the globe. So for me, this is what is important. Those few 
but how do they do it? So this is what I've been researching and this is what I've been finding for those digital enterprises that started from the fringe and then later successfully uh, become what they are. They are driven by three things, passion, action and relationship building. But also it's not just the drivers, the drivers enables them to acquire some kind of soft intangible capital, which although for the look, um, for the initial look, you would think, okay, this is difficult to quantify because of the intangibility and soft nature, but they are actually real. So think about issues like negotiational capital, resistance capital, and aspiration capital. What do this mean? So these are really anchored or directly linked to the passion of these young digital entrepreneurs. Um, for example, uh, what, what, what passion is, is this intense positive feeling to be able to resist any negative label um, that is targeted at them as digital entrepreneurs. And that is crucially important, not being able to accept any negative level, but without the passion, the negative, the, the positive, um, you know, um, feeling to, to, to not to allow that to happen, you know, that leads to what is called resistance capital. Also the positive intense feeling to aspire to be what they feel like they're capable of becoming rather than what they've been perceived as. And also the negotiational capital. They also go ahead through action to develop trust capital and social capital. Now, all of this capital, if you look at, you would see that they are soft kind of intangible, but the, the actual um, where it becomes really interesting is on the next stage of legitimacy, which I'm going to talk about shortly, is that this accumulation of this soft intangible capital is what gives them a buffer in the next round of uh, legitimacy to be able to, to transition or navigate easily. And here I would share with you some of the um, some of the extracts from an interview I happened to uh, to to be privileged to to conduct with one of um, Nigeria's successful companies called the Joberman. Joberman is a job search kind of platform um, that had really expanded in the uh, in West Africa as well. So um, you know, in terms of the passion, you could see that you know they said um, in the interview extracts they started very serendipitously. But then later they developed this intense passion so much so that they've, um, you know, gotten really good stable payment jobs, but then they decided to move and continue to with their entrepreneurial journey. And then um, they, through actions, they said, you know, for them, one of the things that they've done to establish, um, you know, capital in the pre-legitimacy capital is this idea of quick wins. They made sure that if they said they want to post 200 jobs, they did it, they developed their website and, and platforms. And also um, in terms of um, the relationship building, one of the things that I think a lot digital um, platforms are missing, which I've seen this successful digital platforms uh, um, have is the power of the board. So do make sure that you have a board and um, in the board do have some credible people because a lot of people, they look at you, but they look at who is in the board and can they trust the company. And also never underestimate the power of the first deal. It's absolutely crucial because it triggers a whole wave of other opportunities for you. And there's something in their own case here, that is what exactly they said in the interview. Um, so initially they, they have, um, they, they've been funded by an angel investor locally in Lagos, but then 10 months after um, they've got the first funding from Tiger Global uh, in New York. So this is how, you know, it builds up. So you could see the three uh, drivers now in action, passion, action, and relationship you know, that enables them to do that. I also uh, noticed generally as a general characteristic, all these digital platforms that operate in, operate in the 
fringe, they tend to engage in digital bricolage. Digital bricolage is a process where an entrepreneur or the digital entrepreneur try to identify so many underutilized digital assets or resources and then combine and recombine them to create new value. So, and they do so by intimately knowing their local environment, despite the institutional voids, but they're able to find out what are the underutilized or untapped digital resources. For example, they tend to use their technical knowledge base, the amateur local developers, programmers, coders, tell self-taught skills and then they put everything together and then create new value and so this is one of the generalized characteristics that i find so this is where it gets more interesting now they moved from the pre-legitimacy and now the emergence or what i call the liminal liminal liminality is um, a state of in-betweenness where you actually left the previous but you haven't um, the pre-legitimacy, but you haven't achieved full legitimacy. So the reason why the pre-legitimacy is crucially important is that this is where it actually manifests. For example, in order for you to start acquiring the digitally intermediated assets that you need as a digital entrepreneur through the traction of users, the user-generated content, the database of users, the email list, uh, your website, the apps, the cloud, the storage, you know, you want to be able to use some of the soft intangible capitals from your free legitimacy search. For example, I'll give you a clear example. When in the previous instance, in the previous slide, I show you how Joberman were able to attract funding from a local angel investor and then later um, from a New York investor. That clearly shows the manifestation of their negotiational capital. They were able to negotiate a deal. So, and that signal is very, very powerful. And also the rest of the capital, also they all manifest here, you know, in terms of what they were able to do to, to demonstrate that they are actually trustworthy. Um, they, 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 they have high net worth individuals within their board and, and, and all of that. So this helps in this manifestation. And also, like they said, again, here in the interview I conducted with the executive, they said it all starts with the personal legitimacy you know, as, as you can see here. So the personal legitimacy is what helps in building up and acquiring the assets here. So in the previous pre-legitimacy stage, emphasis was on the um, intangible and soft capital, but here the emphasis is on the acquisition of digitally intermediated assets, but that is influenced by the power of the capital accumulated in the pre-legitimacy stage. And then finally, comes the consolidation stage. For all of these companies, you know, something crucially important is the idea like, you know, once they've been perceived as legitimate entities, they negotiated that because I keep saying this negotiational capital because once you find yourself in a position of disadvantage, so constantly you will be negotiating. And for those who missed um, the ability to, to continuously negotiate, then they wouldn't develop that negotiational clout. So here at this point, they acquired the legitimacy. What they do is through identity work, they legitimize what they actually do. And they do that by giving something back to the community, training the younger generation of digital entrepreneurs, mentoring, uh, media interviews, uh, inspirational talks, uh, investing in local infrastructure, in fact, even some of them engage in local activism, and that gives them that sense of identity. So pre-legitimacy stage was about capital, and that is intangible capital. And um, the emergence stage um, um, we, you know, uh, evolves, and now at this stage, emphasis is on the identity they, they, they create. So now this is the kind of life cycle you know that i've seen for those few that are succeeding and hopefully we're learning from them that for all the other digital entrepreneurs operating from the fringe could apply so now i, I just want to talk also quickly about some trends that are happening in terms of 
because it's a platform era, no doubt about it. But, you know, what are the trends happening and what's likely going to be the post-platform era look like? For me, I think like um, when you look at platforms generally in the present, what we see is most of the platforms tend to be a sort of this mass production consumption of contents, a kind of singularity and convergence. We seems to be converging, you know, and a sort of little bit of sort of you could see some other call it monopoly or, or whatever the tendencies to that. But I think in the future, what we're likely going to see are platforms that are going to be more customized, uh, more, more, more individualization of digital content kind of platforms. So we're going to see a lot of modularization of uh, digital platforms. We're going to be a lot more of that instead of this mass um, kind of uh, production that we see. And I think something interesting about culture, I think something that I call either the platformization of culture or culturalization of platforms is bound to happen. Now, people are beginning to say that they could look at you uh, and they would think either you either belong to either you what kind of platforms you use generally. Um, so this is kind of leveling out of cultures to platform cultures where people would be saying, oh, uh, he, he or she has got a, a platform culture, uh, um, a Facebook culture or a LinkedIn culture or a TikTok culture or whatever a platform that you kind of really associate with. For me, this is really fascinating to think like um, going into the future, this is going to, I think, probably uh, continue to, to, to develop more and more. Um, and also, I think this is going to be a lot more on digital artifacts and contents uh, will be given a lot new meanings. Uh, I, at the moment, we're just using them um, either you know, for transactional purposes or for, 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 for um, you know, do, doing other things that, that we enjoy for rentals, for e-healing services, freelance logistics. But I think they're gonna have a lot more meanings, you know, and, and this is gonna be a lot, I, I'm not sure what exactly, but I, I believe that there's gonna be a lot more different meanings attached to, to them. So we are talking about platforms of the future where actually some would start their first platform on AI and 5G networks. So they wouldn't have the knowledge or experience of what actually platforms used to look like. Just like the digital leapfrogging that happened in many parts of Africa with mobile first mindset for those who actually their first mobile in the phone was a mobile phone. They didn't have this kind of brick and mortar a kind of mindset. So what does this mean to the world? Well, I think this opens a lot of possibilities, but I do hope that at the, at the um, core of all of this development that we, we, which is why I'm emphasizing on trying to understand these digital enterprises on the fringe, because if we understand them, I think there's a lot that are offering on the fringe that have the tendency to provide these viable options that we don't tend to have now with the current uh, platforms. So I think the future platforms, I think of a future where it's gonna be increased modularization, um, customization, leveling out of cultures, um, a lot of digital bricolage, but very importantly, I think like it's a future, um, you know, um, that is, going to be with a new generation of digital platform entrepreneurs with a mission to build a more sustainable economy. And this should be encouraged. So instead of just focusing on just the mainstream platforms, we need to really understand the alternate forms of platforms that exist on the fringe, which could actually help the world to be a more sustainable place. So I just, when I say that, you know, like I said, in practice, I, I try to do this and, and put this into practice in perspective, but also I do come across once in a while, some really interesting kind of platforms, which I think for me, they are redefining what the future of digital platforms look like. And one example is called the Entnest. Uh, Entnest is um, 
is short for Entrepre Entrepreneur's Nest. Uh, it's a kind of entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, and what I do like about this platform is that, you know, um, I, the, the first time I was invited to join, as soon as I joined the platform, I felt this kind of uh, positive vibe and energy, uh, you know, uh, in the platform. And they managed to do that, I think, because of the way in which they designed the platform, uh, that first of all, this is a platform based on trust which means that you must be invited by someone else in order to join. It's not like everyone else. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about the customization of and the individualization uh, of platforms. So they try to match entrepreneurs with um, uh, you know, support agencies and things like that, and hence created this healthy ecosystem of sustainable businesses, positive energy. So, and once you 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 registered in there, you'll be able to create your community within the community of other, you know, like, like minds with positive energy and things like that. And I think this for me is one of the things that is really uh, going to define um, the future of enterprise. And we should encourage this kind of platforms, platforms like, for example, the Pan-African Innovation Cluster Academy, the Entnest, and of course there are so many uh, out there, but for given the time, I wouldn't be able to, to, to mention each one, but I just thought these are the ones that really comes to mind. And I think we should encourage um, this kind of uh, tendencies. So um, I think um, with this, I would say that um, I, I, I greatly look forward into the future in which we will support this digital entrepreneurs and digital enterprises on the fringe. Yeah, and thank you so much for listening. And I think I will now give time and to entertain. Yeah, the no, this you might is have. What, a, what a wonderful, <laughs> what a wonderful session here. We have some questions. Let's let's open it up for some questions here. We have a question coming from Martin. Okay. What is your different? What I think he 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 goes directly to the point here, which is impressive. He yeah. goes, "What is your definition of a digital platform, and how does it differ from SaaS?" A solution, for example, software as a service solution, for example. So some clarity is, it might help. Yeah. Um, so I, I think for me, um, because, um, you know, there is no um, one universal definition of platform uh, example, uh, of course, but I think um, for platform, I'm talking about um, a digital artifact where you have a community of users um, who can um, you know, create um, their own user generated content, but then be able to do a number of things. So I think a lot of platforms, um, for example, who are just going, who are just transaction based, they, I think, miss the point of just assuming that they're just transaction based. But for me, I think a platform are somewhere I would go, not just to go and engage in transactional activity and work out, but also what kind of energy do I get from the platform? Like I said, from the example of the internet, you know, you go into that platform and then you walk out of it, you, you feel this kind of positive energy that's gonna last <clears throat> with you for quite uh, some time. So for me, that is what digital platforms uh, are about. Let me open up. I hope that Martin. I hope that answers the question here. There, let's um, let's open up for other questions here. Okay. You know, you you talk about the word fringe, okay? And I, and, yes. and that word fringe is. I think it's a powerful word, especially today with what's going on with COVID nineteen and everything. Yeah. That uh, where a lot of people are hurting on the fringes, if you say. Yeah. And, yeah. But I like your optimism. I'm an optimist as well. Right? Yeah. How would how would how would these platforms, how would these uh, new opportunities, encompass or bring together those people that are on the fringes? Um, what would what would what would you how would you approach this? Um, can, can you ask the question again? How would I approach? Yeah, so how yeah. would you how how would we integrate the individuals on the fringe onto these platforms? Right. Right. What's, what's the what's the path forward, if you may? You know, the world with the internet, yeah. we got everybody online, or most of us, but there's a lot of people that still are not online, right? Okay. Not a lot of people have access. Heck, even in the United States, 
with yeah. online education, you know, there's areas in the United States where kids cannot get education online. You know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah. you know, how would, how, how would you approach this? You know what I mean? Okay. So I think maybe I would say maybe two or three ways to approach this. First of all, um, the recognition that there are um, those, like you said, even in countries like United States and of course, many other countries on the fringe that are struggling. That recognition, I think, is the first step. The second step is for us to continue to understand what are their peculiar needs and their approaches, which is exactly what I'm doing uh, with this uh, path um, that, that, that I've taken. Now, if we understand them well, uh, another thing is to actually invest in the local infrastructure that is going to um, energize their ability to um, to sensitize the, the digital bricolage kind of process. And also, of course, uh, it's important that governments from around the world uh, have clear, more dedicated policies. And I had said this before, like in some countries, you have this kind of devolution of powers where some regions tend to have certain kind of powers um, allocated to them that they can actually use more powerfully to create more suitable policies that help those on the fringe. Because otherwise, um, they're on the fringe, you are in the mainstream, you don't really understand uh, clearly what they, they're going through. So I think understanding um, through research, through investment in the infrastructure and also policies targeted at them might help. But, um, and you know, Mohammed Noor says using, you said using local content is a powerful idea. Um, ex ex expand on this a little bit. What do you mean by local content uh, for, for platforms? How, how would that work? Uh, what is that? Local content. Local yeah, you, content. Uh, lo local content. Well, I think, um, well, the, the local content is absolutely, because I think, um, think of a content um, as something that is not universal and that in order for us to see the pool um, colors, if you like, of, of the universe, you must understand the, 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 the differences in the local content and how they all fit together as, as a whole. So I think absolutely local content because I think the world is missing a lot by not understanding or not knowing some contents that exist elsewhere in some pockets, some very useful, because you know it's, it's, it's a whole ecosystem, it's a whole universe that we're talking about that. And now, especially now, I think the COVID uh, issue had remind the whole world that we are all in this together, that something that would happen in a corner of the world, you know, could affect the whole world in, in such a, a way. It could either be positive or negative. So it's very important that we understand the local contents because I think there are a lot of very useful solutions that, you know, we could learn from such local contents that could be universalized or have a kind of universal tendencies. This is good. Um, and let me ask you one question, Natural here. Right? Okay. And, and I'm curious about this. Now, you know, a lot of people are on different platforms. Okay, yes. look, ICSB is a platform. We, yes. keep, we keep talking about it. And actually, a couple of yeah. years ago, we said, uh, I said that we ICSB is the platform. We bring many different constituents to the platform. You are part of the ICSB platform. Yes. Okay. And we've escalated, we've increased you know, I think in, in, in warp speed, if I want to use a, a, a yeah. high tech thing, is that yeah. we initially were more, I would say we were more 80%, 75 to 80% in person, 20% yes. online. Yes. That's how we were, were operated for, for years. Yes. In, in, in March 10, when I knew that everything was locked down, you know, I tripled down, quadrupled down, and I said, we're going to yeah. go all digital, right? And yes. ISSB, yeah. we were the, the first people to move to yeah. online platform and to create this. And you've seen our work with yes, all these activities we have done here. Yeah. And, and this is for me as president and CEO here, 
Now, we're, we're, I still, we still have time. I think this is not going to go away till March or April next year here. Yes. Yep. But the big, question, the big question that I have that I keep thinking about all the time as, as I move forward is because as a president CEO, I have to work on, on a strategy, on a vision. Right? Yes. yes. What's the balance? I keep asking myself, what's going to be the balance after COVID-19 yeah. between online <sighs> and person? I know people are hungry. I'm, I'm so looking forward to meeting you in person. I'm so looking forward to meeting, you know, a lot of people in person to sit with them, have coffee, have tea, you know, have dinners, have lunches. We are, we are starving for the human yeah. connection. Yes. Right? Yeah. But, but what's the balance? I, I, I don't know what, what you know, okay. if I'm tell the board, you know, what, what you go <laughs> in the future. I'm sorry, uh, give me the answer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but I think it's a very, very good point and the question and suggestion you all make uh, in one point. I would just like to say that, you know, I think it's a very important question you you, you raised about the, the balance, you, you know. Um, th there are issues now arising that people are calling um, um, digital detox <laughs> and, and, and things like that, because even the screen time, the ability, the, the, your ability to be in all platforms, it can be overwhelming, you know, information overloads and, 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 and things like that. Um, and, and this is not going away anytime soon. Um, there's going to be a lot more platforms. Only recently, I was just checking the World Economic Forum website, and you, you can Google and, and see. You know, the first thing when you get into the website is there is agenda, and then there are there is platforms. And then when you click, you would see numerous platforms that are future oriented relating to the, the, the digital platforms and how it was so many of them. So, and now it's. Um, also to bring this point to, for example, our teaching, for example, in the university, um, a, a joke has been told recently that before when you start a course in the university, the first thing you'll be told is, okay, these are your courses that you have to start and blah, blah. But now before you even get introduced to the course, um, you'll be introduced to sign up to this number of apps and these platforms and, and things like this. So, but I think the main important thing, like you said, what's going to happen after the COVID-19, because COVID-19 really accelerated the development of digital platforms and also putting them to use. I think um, issues like digital detox uh, are crucially important, but which is why also certain platforms needs to be given, needs to be more empowered um, so that we could have this kind of personalization and customization so that you don't have to be in all platforms or you don't have to be in one platform that overwhelms you with too many things that you don't really need. So this ability to really, I see like in the future that are gonna be like people who, who are going to be doing work on actually just helping people to choose which platforms to sign for on for. And perhaps maybe the linkage between which platforms you actually sign for and um, the mental well-being and, and health generally. I do strongly believe in the future this is going to happen because you get into one platform and it's a whole world of its own. And then there's another one, there's another one. So this is just uh, what I think. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're right. This is, uh, this is um, an AMS. I know him, by the way. I met him in person. Right, so I want to send my greetings here. He he um he's Greek, okay. so there's a okay. philosophical. There's also always there is a philosophy. Yes, Greek always associated with, with with philosophy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, so, so we're laughing here, but in a good way here. He said, on a philosophical way, should there be a balance in the first place? You know, that's a really good question. You know, and what 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 is it? You know what I mean? I. I, I we, we ask all these questions, but you, these questions are so critical here, you know. And you know, it, it's I don't know the answer. I don't think anybody has an answer. I think we'll yeah. we'll, we'll create it as we go here, yeah. right? But yeah. but there's no going back. And no, I know that no. there's no going back. No. And so how would I imagine it? One thing that I crossed my mind is yeah. that I think our week schedules, how we work on the week, eventually we will start thinking. You know, and you're going to laugh at me here, but I think okay. we're gonna talk, and I'm going to use um, Negroponte's book. He wrote, he was an, a professor from MIT, and okay. he wrote a book, and his book was called Adams versus Bits. Okay. In 1971. And yeah. he proposed, and he said, 
that you need to look at life from two lenses. Adams, okay. which is physical, like actually yes. meeting and greeting, sitting, and bits, which is digital. Yes, okay? okay, yeah. I think we will go back to this concept of Adams versus bits, in which mm. we, will share, we will cherish times where we don't have to look at our phone, look at all this digital stuff, and just enjoy each other's companies, presentations yeah. are gonna be low tech. We're yeah. gonna come into the right, we're gonna just be with other humans engaging yeah. from a human aspect. And you we're know, gonna cherish these moments. And then I, there's the bits, which is a digital approach, which is the online platforms and so on. What's yeah. what's your reaction to this? Yeah, I, I really like this uh, question and the points you make. And like you said, probably there is no one answer to this. Um, but like in my previous presentation, I spent um, uh, m most of the things I discussed were to do with what is called attention restoration space, you know, which are really physical spaces that tend to nourish our sense of well-being. Connecting with nature, for example, uh, we are a social being, you know, speaking with other human beings, you know, this cannot be uh, just taken away by just um, platforms or, or digitalization uh, as, as it were. So I think this balance is absolutely crucial, important, but we have to appreciate the fact that we're now in era of what is called the digital personhood. So which meant that, you know, a part of you is digital and perhaps maybe a part of you, like you said in the Pocahontas book, uh, is, is actually um, the physical. But I think um, this idea of zooming in and out uh, is it, important because I, I think, the, which is why in the last presentation I talked about, you know, the digital clusters that are emerging in the peripheral regions. And I cited an example of um, Dorset, um, a digital cluster because it's, it's, it's a seaside town. So you might still be doing your digital activities in digital platforming. And then um, on a good sunny evening, you go out for, for, for a beach or for, for you know a coffee and, and just enjoy the view. And I think this is absolutely important because otherwise we might end up all being like, um, more digitalized than human. So I think yeah. the human side must not be forgotten. I, I tell you one thing, and maybe we'll, uh, uh, please guys, if you have any questions or comments, go here. I've been, I've been, I've been doing this now in my class for the last month, two months, um, yes. right? Is um, because we are all teaching online, okay? Yes, yeah. So, so everything is recorded. My presentations are recorded and all this stuff is recorded here. So, so when I have my online session with the students coming on, Right, yeah. I start the, my I start my class, and I ask every single person, every individual. I ask them one question, yeah. right? And I ask them, "How are you doing?" Yeah. Okay. Yes. And in the beginning, they don't know how to answer. They're a little bit nervous because yeah. they, they they don't understand why I'm asking how they are doing as a human being, yeah. and as a well being. Yeah. Right. Yes. And 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 after a while, after two or three weeks, yeah. the class has been transformed. Why? Okay. Because we have created a community now of students yeah. and faculty together and yeah. our well-being, everybody's checking in on everybody. Mm. And what, what's, what has happened is that the topics that we have to cover for the week and everything gets engaged as we're talking about how are we doing. Mm. Right? Well, you know, Dr. Terbishi, I was listening to your webinar and you mentioned this and I really, it struck me. The next thing mm. you know, I'm talking about the point Yes. As we're having as we're having a nice cup of coffee together, right? Yes. No yeah. lecture, no PowerPoint. Okay. It is all there recorded. Oh, okay? okay. I see. It's, yeah. Right. And 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 I wonder: is this the next evolution of online learning? Is that mm. when you're actually having conversation, like you and I are having a conversation? Yes. Absolutely. With Muhammad and I, right. The yes. slides are there. The connection yeah. is what's needed. What What's your reaction to this? Very good point. I mean, you see, I, I think of like, for example, this kind of webinar presentations, there's no reason why we can't use them, you know, for our teaching. And if, um, for example, this could be sent, for example, to my students um, in preparation for the lecture, then they listen to this. So when they come to the lecture, it's just going to be discussion, you know, and for me, I think when teaching started becoming more conversational, it gets more interesting because you don't come with this, um, 
you, you know, idea or notion of, you know, you have to know it now. So, but, but they engage in what we've been doing before and, and then um, it becomes more conversational, uh, like, like you said. So I think um, it's interesting. I'm not sure if I answered your question fully well, but that's no, how I no, understand you, it. You did. You, you, you did. I think this is the this is the evolution. We're going actually. I, I think we're going back to the origins of, of human to human mm. and, uh, discussions here. And I, I I like your terms here. I think you come up with wonderful terms here. I think this is this is our evolution is back to the human connection. Yeah, you know? and I think that is really powerful. I mean, for example, you know, when you come to present in this kind of seminars, as you could see, um, every time I present, sometimes I share some personal stories and all that. So in most instances, uh, in a traditional kind of circumstance, when you go to teach, hardly people get into that kind of um, mode uh, as, you know, to, to, to kind of, present something in their own vulnerability as being human, you know, but when you do it here, I, as I do it now, for example, and in the previous where I shared some of the challenges I had or, you know, a place brand or, and how we deal with it, this is very human. And I think the students listening to this are more likely to connect with this and me as a human myself and my own human experience uh, of people who would have experienced the same thing. And I think that um, creates a more one-on-one -on -one communication pathway between us and the students. And, uh, absolutely, you're well articulated, well said. Um, I think I think at this point, well, let's stop here because we're in a very good spot here. Um, I want to I want to thank you all for coming to this session here. This is this is great. This is fantastic. Um, we we have another session scheduled for today. I think this is the last one for GW Entrepreneurship Week, but then we start off tomorrow. But we have one, and I really encourage you to come to this one. This is really incredible here, right? It's um, it starts at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, which is in about in, in about two hours um, here, and it's and the, the title of it is the current status of museums and digital platforms. So Passion and persistence. And it was with, with Lenore Miller and Hilary Morgat Watts. So here we are, we're talking about museums and, 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 and the future of museums and the current status of museums and how they connect with digital platforms. So I encourage you to, to, to go to gwoctober.com. I'm going to write it here um, just for you to, to, to register. There's still time to register. Um, thank you, Sky. Um, and, and also to join us, we have a week long worth of activities. We also have the big event on Thursday. And I want to tell you this, Nasir. The yeah. Thursday event, which is from 9 a.m. to uh, 5 p.m., yeah. guess who created the whole day? Guess who put all the program together and invited the speakers? Guess no, who? Uh, uh, could that be Sky? <laughs> no, my students. Really? Wow. My, my, That's amazing. My, G, my MBA GW students. That's brilliant. That's uh, the brilliant. first day of classes, I told them, let's put on a digital conference. And, my, and if you go to the website, you could see all my students are wow. there organizing the whole day worth of activities. They invited a formidable, amazing panelists from all over the world. They're all that coming in an hour, and we have that, over 400 people registered. For that the day. is absolutely brilliant. Really thumbs up to them. Really brilliant. Amazing, this is amazing. The this is, <laughs> it's the this future, is the future, really. It really is. <laughs> I, I, I gave him the keys and I said, I'm, I'm a professor. I'm going to sit in the back and watch you run the show here. So they've done yeah. just an incredible job. <laughs> so, exactly, exactly. <laughs> wow, yeah. this, this is absolutely brilliant. Good. And, and Nasu, we, we, we thank you on behalf of ICSB and everything for all the great participants here. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you okay. at one o'clock. Okay, thank yeah, you again, sure. everybody. All right, cheers. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you.